article here that uh, got me interested in uh, current education situation. My, my, I've been out of high school a long time. Even my kids have been out for over 10 years, and so I'm a little bit out of the loop on uh, the current condition of uh, high school and so on. And uh, this article explained a lot of uh, what we all have noticed. It, it's uh, concerning a district up in Oregon, Portland area. It says that the uh, North Clackamas schools are on track to be the first students in Oregon required to meet state standards in reading, math, writing, and speaking to graduate a requirement rejected by other school districts as too tough. Some people, I'm going to quote a couple of excerpts here uh, in the article, are calling the requiring of certain standards a risky proposition. And these are the adults. This is the school board saying that it's risky to hold students to certain standards to graduate. Uh, apparently, there's a raging controversy uh, throughout the country on standards-based education. One, uh, one person says stu students and parents have little motivation to stake, take standards seriously unless they are required. As I'm reading this article, I thought I'd missed something at the beginning. I went back and read the whole thing over, and uh, let me quote one more, one more little thing here. This is not just Oregon. Some states have tried this kind of thing. California's tried uh, standards. Uh, they, they added a twist. They allowed students to volunteer to take the test. So I know all of us would have really liked to volunteer when we were in school to take tests and pass in order to graduate. That would have made life much easier. And so these, again, these are the uh, school boards. These are the adults, many, I suppose, of my generation that think they're doing these children a favor. And uh, unfortunately, now that whole attitude has uh, been transmitted down to the generation of students that is in school. One school sophomore, uh, talking about the test, says that people are worried that they are not going to be able to pass it. It's just unneeded stress. And so that... Uh, Again, a, I guess an explanation of why when you go to buy something at a store, the checker can't usually make change unless the computer tells them how much to give you back. You've uh, heard, I'm sure, about the collapse of Enron, a major energy company in this country that uh, recently filed for bankruptcy uh, their stock one year ago, actually up to a couple of months ago, was trading at $80, $90 a share. Today it is less than a dollar. It was down to uh, something like 26 cents a share when they fell apart, and this happened uh, virtually overnight. Now uh, the, uh, all of the truth is coming out that uh, certain people knew certain things uh, earlier than they let on, that uh, even uh, I heard something yesterday that uh, when an auditing company several months ago had come in and was investigating the books of Enron and looking into their financial situation, that uh, the company withheld information from them. The company falsified other information. And so this has, uh, has affected a lot of people. There are people up uh, in uh, various companies that are owned by Enron that have lost their entire retirement savings, people that had seven, eight hundred thousand dollars worth of IRAs now have two or three thousand dollars left. They're starting over uh, with their uh, plans for the future and uh, has affected, uh, of course, many, many people. Both of these are examples of a principle I want to look at with you in the scripture here before us, the age old principle of accountability, something that is wrapped up into the gospel, into discipleship, into what you and I are involved in, and something that we must always come back to and reference on. I want to preach a sermon entitled Reality Check from Matthew 25. Let's read uh, beginning at verse 14 on accountability this morning. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country 
who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Let's stop right there. First of all, uh, we need to consider the gift of ministry. Ministry is not an entitlement, not something you and I deserve or have uh, someone that uh, is somehow obligated to bestow upon us, but it is a privilege, it is a gift, as pointed out here in our text, the talents were given to these servants. They did not earn them. They did not, uh, in the the sense of the word, deserve them in the least. They are simply something given to them by their master. And unfortunately, as we see from high school uh, tests and the attitude I uh, described earlier, our modern culture has obliterated the distinction between something which is deserved and something which is actually earned, and this is causing all kinds of problems in uh, uh, all, uh, all areas of life. It's true as well in the church. Now, we talk about ministry as a gift, and immediately we're, uh, we're set up for a bit of a misunderstanding here, because to use the word gift can be confusing if we look at it purely from a a natural standpoint because uh, you and I when we receive a gift assume that that means no strings attached that it is ours it belongs to us and that's certainly true in the natural realm kingdom gifts are different ministry being a gift from God to you and I is different You and I are given talents to use in God's service. Every one of us is called beyond ourselves. Every one of us is going to be asked to do things that we cannot in our natural abilities do. God is going to give us that privilege. He's going to enable us. He's going to many times give us the ability to do what He's asked us to do since it is beyond ourselves. And sometimes, many times, I'm afraid we receive a gift of ministry, we receive that calling, that opportunity, and we immediately begin to look at it in the natural sense and say, well, this is a gift, it's been given to me, therefore it is mine, it belongs to me, I can do with it whatever I will or whatever I won't do, whatever I choose to do. But uh, uh, the powerful truth from our text and uh, throughout the Word of God is uh, that kingdom gifts are always uh, different uh, because the master who gives you the gift always retains ownership. Verse 27, as you're familiar with the parable here, and as the master is dealing with the unfaithful servant, he makes this statement, So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. And all of these men, even the unfaithful servant to a degree, understood that what they had been given was not theirs exclusively. The master certainly understood that what he had given to these men still belonged to him. And it's been already said this week, but bears repeating that no matter what kind of ministry you've been given, whether it's what we call some of the uh, smaller areas, the beginning steps of responsibility in ministry, uh, 
uh, come some kind of responsibility in the church, a Bible study, a music group, uh, leadership elements that are within the local church, and right on up to congregations, uh, the privilege of pioneering, the privilege of uh, assuming uh, the leadership of an already established congregation, or no matter how uh, large that congregation is, uh, amen, we must always remember they do not belong to us. It is not yours. That ministry is not owned by you. You don't have the right to, to just do anything you want with it or abuse it or misuse it or do nothing with it as uh, in our text. But that uh, God retains ownership. God owns that ministry. And even though He has given it to you, it is in the context of stewardship, not uh, of ownership. There are certain requirements, unlike Oregon high schools, I guess, that we need to uh, establish and demonstrate in order to receive the gift of ministry. There's all kinds of jobs that have eligibility requirements. There's height and weight restrictions, and some of this, you know, has even been thrown out as unfair and obsolete and and uh, uh, some of that gets to the point of absurdity and, and uh, allowing uh, people to do jobs that they can't physically do or uh, they, uh, just on and on uh, throughout all of life, qualifications for schooling and, and uh, uh, so many things that have been set aside in the name of equality, in the name of uh, the level playing field. Uh, but uh, uh, in the kingdom of God, the Lord is still looking for people to qualify for ministry and uh, to demonstrate uh, eligibility. And uh, those areas involve many things. I want to touch on uh, just a couple for a moment here. And one of those is faithfulness. Faithfulness is something that we can only measure in the actions of life. We would all say we're faithful. We would all claim to be that. But, you know, the only way God can really measure that, the only way... A pastor who has a certain responsibility delegated to him can measure faithfulness is by observing the actions and the behavior of the people that claim to be faithful. This ties in with character. God's much more concerned with character than talent or ability or any other thing. God's looking for the real heart issues of integrity and loyalty and honesty and both of these things are observed only over the passing of time. We are talking about a revelation of time. Which, of course, is why the Bible says that a minister should not be a novice. Because he hasn't had enough time to demonstrate faithfulness, character issues, and some of those kind of things. And we could go on and on for a long time about eligibility and the requirements and so on and apparently these men in our text had demonstrated enough eligibility and faithfulness and character to receive what they did and be given the opportunity for more but uh, what I want to look at here along this line of the gifting of ministry and eligibility is that the master takes the initiative and brings a testing or an accounting to the lives of these servants. After a long time, the Lord of these servants came and settled accounts with them. Time to check that resume. Time to audit the books. How many of you know, how many of you have learned, God does that once in a while? Pastors do that once in a while. Begins to take a look at their observable activities, what they have done with what they've been given. That's the only way we can measure these things. That's the only way God can test ministry, test the stewardship, 
test uh, the faithfulness or the lack of faithfulness. Uh, amen. And as uh, the revelation comes uh, forth here, as uh, it is determined whether they are faithful or not, uh, then it issues on out into further responsibilities and reward and so on. And uh, it is uh, obvious here that there is a need to continue to qualify. You and I really like the idea of a tenured ministry. That once we have qualified, we wipe the sweat off our brow and say, boy, I'm glad that's over with. Now I can just cruise for a while. And maybe in the world it works that way. There's certain jobs like teaching and, uh, you know, this gets abused. There's a certain valid principle in tenure and so on. Uh, but uh, it's abused once in a while. You read about incompetent teachers that are hiding behind tenure and they don't qualify any longer. They shouldn't be anywhere in a classroom. They should be gone. Amen. They should be fired, but they can't. There are all kinds of problems getting rid of a teacher, even a, a horribly unqualified teacher, uh, because of this thing called tenure. And uh, in the kingdom of God, uh, when you and I decide we want to be tenured uh, Bible study leaders, tenured music group members, tenured this, tenured pastors, uh, we've got problems. Uh, we have decided we no longer need to qualify. We no longer need to demonstrate those character uh, qualities. And we did that once, and maybe you did, but God expects us to continue to qualify. Amen. I'm, I'm the same kind of uh, driver as Brother Lamb. Everyone is an idiot except me. <clears throat> and if you drive, especially in certain parts of uh, the country, like down in Phoenix this time of year, when all the snowbirds have flocked uh, into the city, you realize it'd be a great idea if they made people re-qualify for driver's licenses. <laughs> Amen. There are some people that just shouldn't be on the road, especially when they're in front of me. Frustrating, but of course a relatively small minor. We're talking about much more important issues this morning. Many professions require the updating of credentials. That just because the doctor graduated with honors 20 years ago from medical school, so much has happened in the last two decades in that field along with every other that they had better stay on top of things. They have got to continue to understand and uh, know the issues and uh, even qualify their certain credential processes that many professions require in order to stay current in your licensing and so on. And so uh, you and I need to, uh, first of all, uh, understand that the gift of ministry is uh, a, 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 something that God still retains ownership of. And that as He questions us, as He challenges us, as He brings to our lives an accounting of our ministry, He is looking not just for a one-time, I did that already qualification way back when, but that we continue to qualify. Amen. And this is all the difference in the world, church, between uh, the Pharisee's attitude of position and titles and we are the chosen people and a, re a real attitude of servanthood and ministry and uh, being faithful to God uh, without all of the external trappings. Now, this brings us to a second area, and that is the danger of self-examination. There's a certain element. Uh, the Bible says, you know, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, a certain element of self-examination that's valid. Even with that, we have to be careful that we don't base that check, even of our salvation, upon our personal opinions. How many of you ever met people that say they're saved and you know they're not saved? Well, they think they are, but they're using the wrong standard. The word Paul uses in that verse in 2 Corinthians has to do with the testing of metals and a saying process 
that determines the actual mineral content of the raw ore, gold or silver, or something like that, as it comes out of the ground. And the standard of you and I examining ourselves, uh, even whether we're saved, even whether we are in the faith, uh, let alone the other areas of ministry and so on, is the truth of God's Word, not our personal opinions, not our preferences, not uh, what we might like uh, or feel good about. It is uh, an objective, uh, absolute standard, and uh, you and I, every one of us, uh, uh, are subject to deception. We are prone to self-deception when it comes to this area. We measure ourselves, we measure our qualifications, our competency, how well we're doing in our ministry, and we're pretty likely to give ourselves a pretty good grade. We're likely to cut ourselves some slack. But we need to realize in this area, as in every other area of life, the heart is still desperately wicked, and we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do. It's interesting that even in the business world, companies, large, small, of every size and description, will not do an in-house audit. When it's time to check their books, when it's time to uh, bring an accounting to their financial health for the last year, even though they may have dozens of accountants on staff, They may even be an accounting firm themselves. They will not do an in-house audit. They will not check their own books. They will hire an outside source to do that for them because they want an objective opinion, unless they're Enron. (laughs) Because even with the best of intentions, and we don't always have those, We are prone to error when it comes to analyzing ourselves because everything we look at, everything we do uh, in the kingdom of God is viewed through the lens of self-interest and that is one of the great challenges that we all face of living this Christian life uh, is getting outside of that self-interest and looking at things actually the way they are and God wants to help us do that. Amen. Uh, We need uh, to realize that if we're going to make it, if we're going to have fruitfulness, blessing, and success in ministry, that we have got to have someone else do the reality check. Amen. That accountability has got to be working in our lives, in our churches, because without that, we are going to get far, far off the mark. The servant in our text, you get the impression here, that he thought he was doing just fine. He thought he was okay. He didn't do anything at all with what he had been given. He went and buried the talent in the ground. But in this distortion of self-interest, in his self-examination, he decided that was okay, that was just adequate, and what more could the master ask anyway? Uh, But obviously, uh, the master had a totally different opinion about how he was doing, so much so that this man was consigned to the fires of hell. I don't know if they still have them, but a while while back, a number of years back, the uh, Reader's Digest company put out a series of books on uh, do-it-yourself stuff. Do-it-yourself, home repair, car repair, gardening, this and that, you know. And and, uh, these uh, these books, uh, if you're a, uh, you know, not too competent in some of these areas like me, are are pretty helpful. You can take a look and save yourself some trouble and not blow yourself up if you change a light switch or things like that, you know. But I I haven't yet seen the book on do-it-yourself heart surgery. I don't think that one's coming out anytime soon. There are certain things that you just can't do yourself. 
There are certain things that are just too complex and too difficult. And what you and I are dealing with in the kingdom of God and in character issues and in the matters of the heart are that exactly heart issues. It's heart surgery, church, and you're not qualified to do it on yourself. And so we come finally to the great blessing of accountability. We have a natural fear of being audited, of being taken account of. This is, again, seen in our text. The servant here is fearful. He's making excuses for what he didn't do, even though, again, I, I really, you know, sense that he's trying to justify himself on the one hand, but realizing at the same time that he hasn't quite done everything right, and so then the excuses start coming. Many people, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a disciple in, you know, the, the pastor-disciple working relationship, there's going to be times when that pastor needs to speak a word into your life, and it is often at that time when the fear kicks in, the excuses start coming. Why you didn't do what you ought to have done. We've got uh, problems today with uh, uh, people that, uh, for all kinds of reasons, are burdened with uh, fears of rejection. The myth that any correction, any kind of word spoken to you to bring discipline to your life is rejection. That is a myth. That's a lie from hell this morning. And unfortunately, again, for a lot of reasons, and I, uh, I'm sorry, most of them are just not valid. You've, you know, come from a dysfunctional family. I know that. We all have. And, and you've had this problem and you never had a dad and and well I'm sorry for all of that I appreciate your situation but your pastor still has to speak to you once in a while and when he does it's not because he hates you I've had people I've had fellow pastors tell me they have had men break down in tears in these moments that's the fruit of the guess the 90 sensitive male syndrome we've got disciples that cry when they're corrected we are having to deal with emotions, hurt feelings. People react in denial, in anger. And all of these are natural reactions to this principle of accountability, but they are going to hinder, if not destroy, any ability of a man to disciple you. And you've got to get beyond that. You've got to just dismiss, remove all these myths, all these misconceptions and all the distortions of this principle at work if you're going to really grow and be discipled and become what God wants you to be. This is the reason some people view discipleship, you know, and this kind of activity, this kind of involvement in a man's life as domination in a authoritarianism and, and controlling and manipulative and all of the other lies and all the other nonsense uh, uh, from people that don't understand uh, what I'm talking about uh, or reject it and say it's not valid. Well, I realize people can abuse it. I know people have abused it. I know uh, there are sadistic, overbearing pastors uh, that have uh, totally distorted this whole process. Uh, uh, but uh, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't eliminate the whole concept of the whole process here uh, because otherwise uh, we create uh, generations of disciples uh, uh, that in a spiritual sense can't read and write, can't make change, can't even function without a, a computer in front of them. And I still haven't seen a computer program that will turn you into a man of God. We have to contend with our own egos our pride. None of us likes 
to be called on the carpet like this. I don't know anybody that enjoys this. We've all got at least some, you know, some sense of self-importance. with that hopefully and try to keep it in check you know you probably won't eliminate it until the Lord comes but uh, keep it in check perhaps you know I've come to a uh, conclusion over the years God is the least bit concerned with my image he could care less about what you think you are about your self image however valid but it's not. Why even say that? It's not valid. Amen. However crazy it might be, God is not concerned about your, your image of yourself and the projection of Mr. Spiritual or Mrs. Spiritual that you'd like your pastor and all the rest of us to think. Uh, God knows who we are and God's whole purpose uh, in this area is to demolish your self-image, to bring you back to reality. That's what accounting does. That's what uh, needed to happen to Enron several months ago. They needed a reality check. They're living in a dream world. Amen. Your pastor is probably not real concerned with your image either. And if he's a faithful pastor and he's interested in making disciples, he is going to take his responsibility to deal with these things now and then and bring you back down to earth. Facing the truth about ourselves is disturbing, but it is necessary. And as you and I are many, you know, I think part of what's happened in recent uh, years is that many of our men have reached their ministerial teenage years and they're doing some of the same things real teenagers do. They're being idiots. They're thinking that the old man doesn't know anything anymore. That dad is just an old duffer from the dark ages who has been hopelessly left behind by the world we live in. But uh, like all teenagers, someday learn, usually when they're about 25, he wasn't so stupid after all. And teenagers, you know what... You know what your teenagers think is that they're not accountable to you. They think they know enough to function. They don't need anybody telling them what to do. All they need is your money. And your house and your car and, you know, lots of... But they don't need you telling them what to do. Because this accountability stuff, that's just for babies. No, the fact is we never outgrow this. No one outgrows accountability. I thank God I've still got a pastor. Thank God I've got not only him above me, but others, uh, many around me that will help to keep me in line once in a while and ask pointed questions like, what the heck do you think you're doing, stupid? Where did you get that idea? That's dumb. Those are all forms of accounting. Reality check. Your wife. Isn't it a drag when your wife brings you back to earth? I hate that. But it is never outgrown. We all need it. And we will need it until the Lord comes back. Everyone needs a Nathan. The true purpose of those in authority over us, our pastors, and others that will be good brothers and uh, speak words like this when necessary, is not to control our lives, it is not to dominate, it is to protect us, usually from ourselves. Nathan saved David's life. David's 
insanity with Bathsheba had we saw you know we read the story and we see the fruit of that and how it worked out and you know it wasn't getting any better how many of you realize that he was not going to get better David is de deluded David has uh, psyched himself out and decided he's fine it's all okay now and uh, everything is going to somehow work out uh, but there is self-deception at work uh, and uh, only as God gives a word to Nathan his pastor uh, and he comes in and speaks uh, uh, to that man brings an accounting to his life uh, is David's life uh, his destiny and uh, the nation of Israel so many things hinge upon uh, that one man and his willingness uh, to bring David into an accountability for what he had done and challenge his life and thank God David heard that David received that and responded as we all ought to respond and repent sometimes you're going to be called to account on a personal level there'll be those moments you know those special moments amen when the pastor wants to talk to you personally many times though it comes over the pulpit most of the accounting in our lives comes in preaching thank God for good faithful preaching that will keep us in line keep our hearts right keep our heads on right and it's amazing what happens when a pastor begins to bring an accounting especially in moral issues in church what happens to good people who will say amen but all of a sudden uh, when their little princess gets popped for fornicating and gets the left foot of fellowship for a short time uh, all of a sudden, we're messed up and we're a cult and we're too harsh and on and on and on. Uh, no, uh, moral issues are going to be one of the defining issues in the life of the church, uh, already are, but are going to continue to be so and ever more so. And uh, you and I need to be willing to stand there and exercise the accounting God asks and requires of us and just take the, uh, the, the shots and let the chips fall and uh, let, it, let it just work out because... Uh, that doesn't go over too well, as some of you have found out. You can't back down from that, Pastor. You've got to stand and bring your people to an accounting and hold them to the standard of biblical purity. Somebody said this, accountability is allowing someone to ask penetrating, sometimes uncomfortable questions in order to challenge you to grow. Ran across uh, uh, actually an old illustration, and uh, this will be new to some of you, from uh, a book by Chuck Swindoll. Who uh, you know, uh, it's funny to watch the, the church world, who does not have the kind of fellowship we do, try to institute certain things to provide the fellowship practices that we have, like accountability. And so, what's uh, been a recent phenomenon is accountability groups. Groups of men, ministers or preachers or whoever that agree to hold one another accountable. And that's, you know, not a bad idea. If you don't have a fellowship, you've got to have something, I guess. So praise God for them. And uh, they, they had these questions that they agreed they had the right to ask one another. Listen to this for a minute. Number one, have you been anywhere this past week with a woman that might be seen as compromising? Number two, have any of your financial dealings lacked integrity? Number three, have you exposed yourself to any sexually explicit material? Number four, have you spent adequate time in Bible study and prayer? Five, have you given priority time to your family? Six, have you fulfilled the mandates of your calling? And seven, have you just lied to me? Amen. Do they know human nature? That's the way we are. And again, thank God for a fellowship who has incorporated and, and just built accountability right into the fabric of what we are. I mean, it's, it's part of what we are. It has to be what we are. We are accountable to one another. We are accountable to our pastors. We're even accountable to our congregations. There's a mutual back and forth, up and down, side to side accountability that is so powerful and such a blessing when we understand it correctly, when we view it correctly, when we don't uh, get all carried away by our egos and self-importance and say, I don't need that, you can't tell me what to do, but receive it, uh, be open to it, uh, and be willing to repent uh, as David did when uh, the time comes and when God 
comes right down our alley. We don't want to see any Enron bankrupt ministries hiding from accountability. You know, we, we don't have a whole lot officially in place. One really simple manner of accountability we try to establish in our churches is to send in a monthly report. And I, I really felt God dealing with me just to mention this quickly that uh, why is that such a such a hard thing for you to do pastor you know just fill out the paper and send it in are you hiding something what I don't understand the deal here you know what do you do send all your books through your paper shredder before you take out the trash it, it's, it's strange you know the First Church of Enron, what is it? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, this stuff had been going on for a while. All of a sudden, it blows up in their face. And, you know, the owners, the, the bigwigs, got out selling hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stock over the past 12 months, and all of a sudden, it's worth nothing. wonder how that happens. Well, I've seen that happen with churches, too, and it's a tragedy. We're trying to prevent that. We don't want to see that happen to you. We want to see you make it, and we want to help you make it, and that's why we're going to hold you accountable. And I expect you to do the same to me. And without accountability in operation, there is no discipleship taking place. Amen. We've got to be accountable to God, our pastors, one another, for the ministry He has given us. Amen. Brother, if you'll come, we're through.